Good evening. Hi. Thank you for coming. I'm glad that storm is coming tomorrow night, <laughs> although I'm not glad for the people who have their performance tomorrow. Does this mic work? No. no. <clears throat> That's for the recording and the live stream. So, if the sound is not OK, just wave your hand back there, and we'll project more. Thanks to the Wood Art Gallery, if you make a donation of $10, in the donation box, you may take a free book. If you already have our books, you're still well welcome to make a donation. <laughs> and it can be more than $10. Thanks to the Wood Art Gallery. This is a great place. We're glad to come here. Thanks to the Kellogg Hubbard Library, who sponsors this and organizes it every year, and particularly to Michelle Singer, who does a phenomenal job organizing all of these events for the 15th annual Poem City. On that bench back there are not only our books, but programs for all the events. You can also get those online at the Kellogg Hubbard Library. And thanks, too, to the Poetry Society of Vermont, many of our members have contributed to this event. Scudder Parker has been a minister, is still a gardener, has been a state senator, a gubernatorial candidate. He lost. <laughs> a, a devoted father and grandfather, energy analyst, and brings all of these things to his poetry. Thanks. So I just want to say thank you all for being here. Um, I want to especially thank my grandsons for coming and their father for bringing them and coming. He's a poet of his own. We're trying to get him out more into the public. Um, but he's just had a chapbook published. Um, and it's just so much fun. This is what the poetry is for, is nights like this and a chance to do this. So I have a couple of introductions. The first one is, you may wonder who that guy sitting behind the piano is, <laughs> although you may not. You may know already. It's Jim Thompson, who's the Renaissance man of Montpelier. Um, so I did, uh, you know, I, did, I don't want to do a long introduction, but he's known as Piano Jim. How many people have, here have heard him in various forums? Yep, that's what I thought. And I, I knew him back when I was a minister, and we both worked together at Camp Weakoe in Northfield. So there. there. What? My kids went there. Your kids went there. OK. Well, that, that's part of it, but he's also a singer, a songwriter, gifted musician. Um, he called us after he read the poems that we were going to um, read, and he was going to accompany them. And he said, well, I think I'll bring the guitar and the uh, harmonica as well. So th that just shows you his range. He's a creator of a musical called Halfway House. How many people have seen that? Halfway there, there you go. Halfway there. Halfway there. Halfway there. Halfway there. Um, and, he, and, and then I find out he's a gifted artist. Um, you paint ki kites yeah, and kites. like large objects and yeah. things like that, right? If I have to, mostly kites now. Mostly kites. OK, so if you want a special kite, with a, you did one with a tiger, I believe, that was phenomenal. Um, and he's an actor. How many people saw him as Lurch? in um, The Addams Family. <laughs> he totally stole the, uh, the whole show as Lurch. Could you? No. <laughs> We're not going to let you this do is that. Short well, yeah, sure. This is the short intro. <laughs> yeah, well, I got going. And George Longenecker, I won't, I won't take as long for him. He's another institution in central Vermont. He taught for years at Vermont Technical College where he was the professor, a professor and the chair of the Department of English, Humanities, and Social Sciences. He's been a leader in poetry in this area for years. He has a volume called Star Root. It's been published widely. And he's an 
he, he supports everyone in the life and work of poetry. So thank you for all that you do for that. You're, and you're welcome. For Poem City as well. So now am I supposed to read something? <laughs> I think you are. Oh, OK. So um, we're going to read in uh, you know, about a 12, 15 minute um, chunk, and then George will read. And um, Jim is going to do what he's going to do. <laughs> okay? okay. We don't we don't know for sure. The first poem is called In the Air to Sanibel. And I'm reading about community, but the reality is George's poems as I listened to them the other day in our <laughs> rehearsal were about artwork or photographs, but they're all about community too, right? That they, means yeah. Pretty they are. pretty much. So, this is called In the Air to Sanibel. The plane is full. Again, we've let them pack our restless bodies in a sleek silver cigar, a brief anonymous intimacy we exchange for quick and far. Every seat holds purposes and hopes, perhaps regret, like any walk down any street, but we are close as frog's eggs, breathing each other's air, treading each other's feet. Without a word, of course, brief reminders of peril shared, turbulence, image of a lost wing, <laughs> terror at the delicate trick that holds us in the air. The daughter of the couple behind us screams as we ascend. The mother soothes calmly, singing, itsy bitsy spider, and the wheels on the bus. The father, silent at first, joins in, their voices blend, kindness gathers allies. That quick impulse to annoyance seems absurd. The child quiets as the song continues, most of us whispering the words. <laughs> you can do that at the end. This is one, I, I was a minister for about 20 years in East St. Johnsbury in Lower Waterford, and this is the old home day parade. I remember it with some joy and a great deal of uh, anxiety. I think I was always, I was always performing um, in a sense at the old home day parade, but I remember it more and more fondly over the years. This is the old home day parade. Late in the time of dying elms, down by Rod's Exxon Station, where the parade always forms, next to the yard of the recently abandoned school, four horses scuff the highway with iron shoes. Sixty years ago, right here, the ruts of May were worn down to July's dust. Elwyn's hands are full of reins. The horses, spooked by tractors, the tailor boy on his crepe-papered bike, the town band practicing, 18-wheelers grumbling and belching behind the sheriff's car. This year, the theme is East Village yesterday and today. Same theme as last year and the year before. <laughs> Though it never seems they will, enough participants and watchers show up to make it all worthwhile. There are, as always, floats depicting the history of the town. Committees have been arguing all week about the way things were, improvising outfits all morning. Up the road on a scrap of lawn that hasn't yet slipped down to the river, next to the pool where Pat Bradley used to raise the flag each morning, Ralph Chafes Sr. sits in an aluminum folding chair. The cold of 90 Vermont winters hides in his Afghan-covered knees. His hands are heavy on his lap. Helen is in the nursing home this year. Across the road on the church lawn, Irene Stanton worries out loud to Ann Smith, the parade is late again, like always. She's glad this time she doesn't have to be a judge. Last year, in order to include everyone, they invented more categories than there were contestants. Next year, she'll sell her home to one of the Ely kids 
and pack a few belongings into a single room in town. The parade begins crowded into a quarter mile of Route 2 with the ghosts of all the earlier parades and all that will follow. The horses first, the rubber tired wagon, so no one will get hurt if Elwyn loses control. Tart La Bounty follows, grinning at everyone, squawking the horn of his black Model A, which doesn't help at all. They creep past the bridge where Route 2 used to cross the river to the mill, past the granite blocks of the mill's foundation guarding the opposite bank, past the clay pipe choked with knotweed through which a few homes still contribute directly to the river. The tailor boy, as usual, can't stay in line, racing past Joyce DeWitt and the ladies' kitchen band, weaving in and out among the Ellis children, dressed as the Four Seasons in East Village, crepe paper tattering in his wheels. He is overcome with the present. It is all he can feel. There is no stopping him. Ralph's friend, Mac Ford, who died four years ago, sits beside him. There are corners of ground all over the town that he hayed by hand, scythe and a wooden rake, that now grow up to burdock and willow. All those places belong to him. Now they don't belong to anyone. The barn he stored the summers in has finally crumbled back into the hillside. Roland Parento on the old John Deere 50 drives equipment up and down this road all summer, watches the people watching the parade. He wonders if he will have a stroke the way his father did and not be able to keep farming. Maybe in 20 years there'll be a float about the last farm in East Village. The church service posed on the hay wagon he's pulling doesn't look like any that Irene can remember. But it's good to see the young people who quit church so promptly after Sunday school make an effort. The parade has streamed into the Parento's hayfield. Those who have come back for the day walk over to Irene. Her greeting means their visit is official. She's the one who does the work of re recognizing and remembering. She sees them and knows them at once like the print of an old dress. Alaska, Ohio, the next town over. They each bring their private past. They all want to be missed. And then there are those things you wake up at night thinking, how did I ever do that? This is called Talent Show. This is down in the church basement. She played trumpet at the talent show in the church basement badly, <laughs> with enormous enthusiasm. We snickered with almost no restraint at the music and her enormous heaving eighth grade breasts. <laughs> Fragments like this come flying at me like deadly pieces of space litter, still in orbit after all these years, and here I am in the small safety capsule of my delicate identity, frozen in time. She may be a grandmother by now. We might recognize each other in the checkout line at Shaw's. She'd ask in her husky voice about my sister and brothers. I'd tell them the usual something. Perhaps I could wait for her to go through the line, walk with her to the parking lot, ask her about her life and listen. I've learned to do that. I suspect she'd forgive easily if I had the courage to ask. Or she might barely remember. For her, it was just another bunch of stupid boys acting like they did. Probably much worse happened. Yet here she is, listening to an old man explain what she's so long understood. And one more. This is called Barn Swallows, and this is for Cashel. Here, millennia before the barns, they're named for 
They promptly claimed the beams and rafters and perpetual refuge of sun-stippled dusk, moats drifting weightless through light shafts between boards. Fields torn from forests had exploded into daisies, summer grasses, black-eyed Susans, asters, sprawling purple vetch, and teeming webs of creatures there for lightning capture on the wing. They dove through openings, one a fist-sized outline of a barn cut out for them to nests pasted on hand-hewn wood. Each summer, hay mows stacked tight with fragrant bales inched toward the, their open mouths. Urgency wider than their tiny heads, they hinged, echoed our urgency as summer was brought in. We could not tell who welcomed whom. They never bragged about their longer residence. My grandson has a friend whose grandfather lives in the valley, still hays some fields, fills an old barn. We visit, swallows chatter from the rafters. I embarrass him in yet another way, trying to find words for the ordinary joy of being in each other's company. Thanks, Scudder. Thanks to Orca Media for taping this. And thanks to my wife, Cynthia, my poetry muse. She's away for two months being Nana to her grandson. They need the help, but she'll be able to watch this on Orca. What a great space to do ekphrastic poems, poems of art. I can't think of a better venue Still life, from a painting, Sheep in Snow, by Joseph Farkinson. It's still as sun sets, light snow in a pasture. We look west into orange sunset, scattered clouds in shades of pink. Still enough light for long shadows, from trees on a small rise, shades of orange in snow. Sheep graze for what grass they can find, waiting for sunset when they'll return to shelter outside the picture frame. The winter is brown and gray. Their pasture is full of color, peaceful at solstice sunset. Do sheep worry, like we do, about what might come when night grows cold? Though shadows cross their pasture, there's still color, still life as daylight fades. What more could we ask? Cold War. Nineteen soldiers, ponchos flapping in wind. Perhaps they're a chosen reservoir. Perhaps on Heartbreak Ridge. Winter War. Korea, so cold. They slog on through ice and snow, each clutching his weapon. Frank Gaylord's sculptures, neither alive nor dead, frozen in time, like war that never ended. Magpies fly over the border, quiet now in the DMZ, where they nest in maples. So many dead there, some left behind, a mere dimming between life and death as sunlight fades and night grows cold. War, 19 soldiers frozen in time. 
An acrostic poem can also be about a photograph as well as a painting or sculptures like the Korean War Monument. Newly fallen, snow covers his face, body facing gray sky which he can't see, one arm outstretched to the right as if reaching out when he was shot, Kharkiv under siege, everything gray, another cold war in the photograph, nearby troop carrier, a caterpillar, blackened, burned, tread blown off, nobody alive shown. A mother and father will get the news. Death doesn't take sides. All decay and return to soil. Traffic light, street lamp, burned building, all dark, snow, newly fallen. Salt and sorrow, a kitchen in a residence in Aleppo, Syria, damaged Sunday and fighting. Narcisco Contreras' photo, the New York Times. Walls are blackened. There's a refrigerator with rust at its bottom, stickers of yellow butterflies and, bu and blackbirds on the door. A dish towel hangs on the door handle, and atop sits a vase of purple paper flowers. On shelves, jars of spices still stand upright. We can't see what's upright in the rest of the home, if its power is on, or if walls and windows are intact. Charred ceiling plaster covers the floor. No mortar shells or shrapnel, though. A jar of beans lies unbroken in a tiny drawer, maybe for salt. We don't know, but nobody can live without salt or sorrow, no matter where. On a lower shelf rest three small pairs of shoes. We can't see the children, the parents, or the photographer. They must all still be somewhere outside, but outside is not in the picture. We can't hear if there are explosions and artillery fire. On the wall hangs pan, hang pans, a strainer, and measuring spoons. Why do some things fall and not others? All the utensils are blackened, but we can't tell whether from cooking or just war. In a dish drainer, cups dry. They'll need to be washed again if the family returns. If they live, their blackened kitchen sent naked around the world. Portrait. In his self-portrait, visiting Florida this winter, Van Gogh gazes forever left. He's painted his hair and beard red eyes blue. He looks a little like his brother Theo. When Vincent painted this, he had only a year left to live, and Theo would be gone the following year, having lived so his brother could paint. We never know if Vincent stepped out of his frame into Florida, what would he paint? I'd offer him pink grapefruit, We'd paint on the beach together. The day would turn red, turn hazy and hot. Maybe we'd paint rippled scallops and lettered olives on the sand. Perhaps we'd float into the swamp to paint alligators and herons. There's a point at which we realize we'll die, but we can't know when. What if we could bring our brothers back and say, paint this now, 
you have only a year left. But today, it's just Vincent and me. We paddle out, paint an alligator basking by the Loxahatchee, then a tricolored heron. It flies off, and a feather drifts slowly down. I keep the heron's feather. I can't forget my brother's last year. He drifted like a feather through the air and was gone. The heron circles and calls. Vincent and I drift. If only he and Theo could have known. If only Keith and I could have known. Mixing color from his palette Vincent fills in water and sky, paints red the heron's eyes. Scudder. How are you doing? <laughs> So it, when I think about community, I think often what we have in mind is some kind of niceness. You know, a, everything's good. But community is really about an ongoing process of joy and loss, finding, grieving, recovering, learning new things about the world we live in, and the people who are a part of our lives. And this one is about elm trees, which just feel like they have, you were a part of the Vermont community, and I still want them to be. Elms. All the way from Pittsburgh to Phoenix, the men behind us talked marketing and never once gave a clue what the product was. <laughs> In college, Clay Hunt said, it's not what you say, it's the way that you say it. It was a kind of a chant by the English department, something they had learned. So if I want to say, for instance, that I miss the elm trees, I should tell you, they held up the sky over our North Danville farm, domed and rustling, alive with orioles, dancing among raised arms, perfectly trained to lift the daily weight of blue. Or should I just admit, I can't tell you how much I miss them. And it's also noticing people and connecting with them, which drives my grandchildren and sometimes my wife crazy. <laughs> um, but the people on the perimeter that you don't always acknowledge. This is November sunlight. She and her silent companions sit in a patch of unanticipated sun on a wooden bench bundled against November's cold. Her companion stares down at the freezing ground, but she looks up at me as I cross the park's leaf-littered lawn toward their small bit of warmth. Nothing much, her smile warns, a cordial sound, the greeting of a different voice. Her glove rests on her partner's silent, mittened hands, unwaveringly loyal. Still, she claims this small permission. I want to stop and talk with her, but that would be too much. I only say, how wonderful, November sunlight. And when I was a minister, I guess I was professionally engaged in community um, and kept trying to figure out what the heck I was supposed to be doing with this job. <laughs> right? <laughs> this is called Good Work for the Preacher. It's a practice in humility to come to a small church in a poor state where resources for pretense are scant where need wears thin clothes, pride does for hope, 
Theology is less important than good chicken pie. You learn to love the details, not the answers. Trust your heart and ears. Kindnesses and the embarrassments they cause in other men. Gaining knowledge that could give control. Trying not to use it again and again. You eat ordinary food till it becomes the food you crave. Stay till they no longer ask if you'll be leave leaving soon. I remember a funeral performed for a man I never knew. On a hilltop in Waterford, an urn, a sunny afternoon. A family full of silences. Mid-service, I realized he had died of AIDS. The brother who had left for San Francisco, gone for years, home now to be buried in his family's fears. I was invited to a 40th birthday party for a friend. Cross-dressing was required. I wore a kilt, black tights, bean boots, and danced like David till the end. His cousin read a poem about growing up gay in Plainfield. His mother complimented on her dress, bragged she had stolen it from her son. I danced in the space we'd begun to claim, and as welcome for the high school friend who loved me but had no name to give his love. I danced for all the dead, the stories carried to the grave. I danced for those who watch in waiting still, for the quietly subversive, the outrageously brave. And this is one, I think of this as Susan's poem, for a family and friends gathering. This is called Blessing. You compose a table from all the tables in the house. Drape them with old linen till it snakes through living and dining rooms like a Chinese dragon. White metal lawn chairs come up from the basement slumber, antiques from the bedroom where a week of clothes lands on the floor. You dig to the back of the drawer for cheap stainless and then the family silver untie ribbons, hugging it in chamois cloth. Wine glasses from pewter to crystal alternate around the table, suggesting a symmetry in all their history. You remember the spoons that melted in the fire that no one here remembers, and the fourth and missing crystal glass. Guests bring the cold air in, each with their offering of food, laughter, and greeting for old friends and strangers they embrace because you love them all. Voices rise in the living room over wine, crackers, chopped liver, baba ganoush. There's that last minute rush, the comfort of it. This in, this out of oven or refrigerator. It's as you bring your kugel to the table, the absence races through you, the laughter here invites the laughter that is gone. How can we be joyful in the company of loss? Your knees are weak. You lean into your closest friend, pause, slowly start to breathe, and we begin now that the meal is blessed. And this one is called Bandstand. Um, it's no secret, it's the, um, it's the Middlesex Bandstand, where they have wonderful summer con concerts. Children gulp music with the air, race bare feet, bare legs, no sleeves, sun sinks clinging to the leaves. On the blanket checkered lawn, adults listen or talk quietly, tree swallows spill their liquid sound. After the concert, fiddle returns to spruce and gut. Bow stops quivering against its strings. Musicians step back into the present, thanked for their commission or communion 
with that other place they've been. Children finally still like instruments, slumped and lovely, twined and carried in the rich noodle hug of need. The drive home echoes with wild song and play, fading, hesitant, reluctant to forsake the day. And then finally, um, this is about a trip that we took on Elmore Pond. And we always try not to be just on the pond, but to find the marshy areas or the secluded areas or the place where the ducks might be. And we went up to the where the stream flows in to the pond. I have to say, we went back three years later, nothing was recognizable. <clears throat> Is that from the logging? No, from the flood. Oh. <laughs> it just washed everything out. Lake Elmore, October 1st. Curled beige feathers downy at the base litter the stream that wanders toward us and Elmore's lake. Beavered alder branches, submerged pond hair cushions, duckweed corralled by viburnum roots, all strewn as though by a gentle pillow fight. We paddle past managed shorelines with tidy cottages to this neighborhood of lily pads and pickerel weed hidden from their sight. More happens here, like the basement daycare center, chorused with children, always cluttered, doing a better business than the church. This is the water's sweet meander, slow channel where merganser mallard grew. It's also where the storm flood races through. My grandson cried when he gave up his first and favorite bike, the one he trusted enough to let his feet release the ground. I had to argue with myself against the urge to dry his eyes, hurry him along. Stop, honor that lonely keening sound. Two young ducks try to keep one bend upstream from us. Trapped by our invasion, they finally stop. One leaps to flight, the other hides behind marsh grass in a small alder pocket. We paddle by, eyes averted, our small courtesy. It quivers as we pass. Six summer weeks, this was their home. Now they leave for something new. I think detachment. That's illusion, too. In the next pool, a heron rises, scarecrow taking flight. We look for it at every bend, plying its silent heron tricks again. But a beaver pond opens before us, flood at eye level, no heron but wide water sweeping, seeping through a thousand sticks. This summer we went up five streams. The beaver, dogged Calvinists, seem to insist it's the effort, not the dam. That's permanent. We postpone leaving, poke up every bulrush alley, give in at last, stroke hard across the open reach, land on the expanse of beach. Women in bright saris watch their boisterous men play tag, joined by the youngest daughter. We greet them, lift the boat, leave our visit in the water. This is from a photo of my wife Cynthia's mom's wedding in Plainfield. Wedding photo. In black and white, the bride and her five bridesmaids pose on the stone portico of a white church in Vermont in white gowns holding bouquets of flowers, May 1947, all in their 20s, 
War over for two years, long lives ahead. Today the bride's sister died, the last of six in the photo. Nobody knows the day they'll die, unless perhaps they're in a war. But war had ended. Now, at last, they could live. There wouldn't be another war, at least they hoped. Certainly not in this Vermont village with its white clabbered church. All six lived near the church, some in the village, others on back roads where families farmed. After the war, they had to be optimistic. So many dead, so many. Now it's been over 70 years, and that May they weren't thinking about war. They pose, six young women on the steps of a church in Vermont, sending off one of their own. Sugar maples shade the lawn, and though it doesn't show in black and white, leaves are fresh green, and there's a scent of lilacs. Maples, stone steps, church bell are all still there, but the wedding party has gone. Lazarus and Six Horses, a sepia photograph, circa 1891. The horse's ears are perked and alert. <clears throat> they seem to watch the photographer. Even in sepia tone, we can see their different shades of brown and gray, hitched together and used to pulling as a team to thresh winter wheat. My great-grandfather, Lazarus Paget, stands to the left of his horses, barely holding the reins as his horses pose, overalls, hat in hand, probably the year my grandmother was born. In the only other photo, his horses are hitched to threshers, wheat and horses now on what had been Kiowa, Ottawa, Ojibwa and Potawatomi land for a millennium and more, all forced onto reservations. I don't know what Lazarus thought of this. Some of his family were probably part Kiowa, or what he'd think of Kingman now, just a few large farms where there were once dozens, wheat from his fields shipped around the globe, Summer day is almost always over 100 degrees. A four-lane highway to Wichita, his great-grandchildren scattered across Kansas and all over the country. None of us farms, and only one has horses. Three generations apart, our lifetimes overlapped only briefly, but we grew up in different worlds. I look at Lazarus and his six horses and wish I could ask him their names. Athena's Owl. At Half Moon Pond in our tent late at night, we hear three barred owls call over and over, mythical owls of Athena Next day at the sculpture studio, an artist carves an owl from pure white marble. If only the owls could know that now they're almost immortal. Marble Quarry. A dozen sculptors have reclaimed a corner of an abandoned quarry. Dragonflies and swallows fly over, while other creatures emerge from marble. 
out of stone, a heron and an owl, a white whale, two ballet dancers, boss relief ducks and nesting loons. At night, the quarry is eerily quiet. An owl perches atop a rusting crane. Her hoots echo off walls of abandoned stone sheds with shattered windows. Then each morning, under tents and tarps, carbide chisels and diamond blades squeal as mallard ducks take flight on marble wings. Dancers leap from stone, white slippers barely touching the ground. Swans swim at dawn. Four swans swim circles around the small pond of reeds and cattails across the road from my hotel room, drift back and forth, dipping their beaks to feed. Not much water, but just four, not Yates, nine and 50 swans. Years ago, when I was 13, an amusement park, Pleasure Island was built here on the edge of wetlands, where now there are condos, offices, hotel. It was a short-lived attempt to imitate Disneyland in a Massachusetts swamp. How much pleasure or amusement kids got, I'm not sure but I saw Ricky Nelson play right over there, not far from the pond, where swans swim in low light just after dawn. I wondered why the teen idol had to sing on stage near Gold Pen Gulch and a white whale in a small amusement park in a swamp. But it wasn't his swan song. He performed another 23 years before flying to his death. Ricky Nelson just liked small stages where he could play for a few hundred screaming teens. His voice and guitar always pitch perfect. I can still hear him sing Unchained Melody. Hello, Mary Lou. Someday, someday, I'd like to swim like a white swan, go back when there were songs like Lonesome Town, when we could be so moved by an idol, so easily amused, Pleasure Island. Swans still swim in low light just after dawn. Rain taxi. Soft music down a windy street, worn smooth by light years of frustration, traffic, the fugs. 1964. Two red oak leaves stuck to the side window of an old checker cab. Headlights reflected in dark puddles the old Hancock Tower's light glowed red for rain, and from a higher building, a beacon revolved in the night. Horns of boats in the harbor echoed through streets where water splashed up from gutters, ran down sidewalks. There in a corner, I thought I saw you with your bag of poetry books, pens, first drafts, a stoplight glowed red in a puddle, and when my cab finally moved ahead, you were gone. Of course, I should have known it couldn't be you. We wouldn't write any more poems together. I'd seen you die on the first day of spring. I forgot where I was going in all this rain. I didn't know why the streets were so wet, 
why this cab was so old. I forgot what you had been writing about the last time we were together. The rain taxi crossed rivers of streetlights. This is my poem for Poem City this year. And you can write an ekphrastic poem about a building. Love poem to a library. How can I say which book I love the most? It's like asking which is my favorite child. Easier to say I love the library as I walk up granite steps out of rain and sleet through the portico into the reading room. Paper lanterns made of poems hang everywhere. I wander to fiction stacks but stop at Calder's animals, lithographic red and yellow cats scampering with an elephant, and, and glance up at a Grecian frieze. I head for art books, move on to the history shelves, then get distracted by poetry posters everywhere. Oh, library, the more I check you out, the more I realize. It's you I love. Eclipse. Robins, already back in April, begin their evening songs, perhaps perplexed that it's already dark. Through our eclipse viewers, we watch moon slide slowly over sun until stars and planets shine in the sky. Then slowly this brief nightfall slides back into daylight as robins sing again. Some days, I don't understand the world. So much I love has been eclipsed by banality and uncertainty, but I'm glad robins still sing, and humans too, even when perplexed by darkness. Thank you. Let's hear a special for Jim. Thank you. Did I tell you that he has a mean slice on his pickleball? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for being here. And uh, feel free to wander around, enjoy the lovely creations all around us. And we're here to talk if you want to do that. Are there, I, I don't think we talked about a question and answer period, but if anybody has anything they want to ask, ask Jim. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, how, how was your first time playing with musical accompaniment? How do you feel it? I loved it. Um, how did you like it? I thought it was delightful. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was a really great and brave experiment. Yeah. Well, um, George and I decided to do this. George was the instigator. And then he said, what about having music? And I said, well, I have this friend. And we invited Jim, and that's how it happened. We did one, I don't think you could call it a rehearsal, could you? One, a tryout. A yeah. tryout, a, a scoping session. Jam session. Yeah. yeah. No, it wasn't a jam. It was, it, was, it was a very small jar if it was a jam session. So, Jim, did you have uh, all the poems that you were reading along with? Yeah, I just like, had the book of poems. Yeah. And we gave him notes yeah. of where we, where we wanted. Not, not words. No, no, that's all. It, Mm -hmm. And when we came here to practice, it was just like, oh my God, we just started reading something and he would just start playing. Nice. Mm -hmm. Incredible gift. Mm -hmm. so. 
anything else? So say hi to each other. Great to see you, and hope we all get a chance to say, uh, give you a hug before you go. <laughs> and enjoy the art. Yeah. Yeah. And only 33 more home city events to go. Uh, yes. <laughs> you get your programs back there. Get the programs. Thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs>